right where you are right now, right now, give God praise in this moment if you believe that he is the only one who can. That's one of those things that we say so easily, and some of us, our whole lives, we have been taught to think that way as Christians, and yet what it means to live as if that is absolutely true can be something else entirely. But this is one of those times, is it not? And so, would you join me now for reading from God's Word, coming to us today from the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the Word of the Lord. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Our God, that is who you are. You are the one who turns graves into gardens, bones into armies. You are the one who breathes life, your resurrection life, your eternal life into that which the world has given up on as dead and gone. So Lord, we raise you up this day in our hearts as we talk more about what it means for you to have been raised up, not only to eternal life, but ascended to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we glorify you as King of kings, as Lord of lords. And there is peace in that proclamation. There is joy in that revelation. There is hope in that truth. And so we gladly receive that as you offer it because of who you are this morning. Open our hearts now, our ears, our eyes, to receive, Lord, to hear, to see what you would reveal of yourself now in and through these ancient words. We thank you. We give you praise. In the name of the risen and ascended Lord, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, sir. Well, how are we doing, church family? Every day is a new day, that's for sure. And uh, as a friend of mine said not that long ago, this is a time where we are learning, if we will receive it, what it means to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Every day is new, and so we are constantly aware of, of what is happening around us. And I want to ask you, are you aware of what might be happening within you in this time? That's something I want us to be so mindful of. And as Pastor Jen has already led us in our time of prayer, what is it that we are sensing with God right now? Somebody said recently, when you come out of this time of, of pandemic, do you want people to know what your, your plans are or do you want people to know that you have been with the Lord? That's a serious question to consider. And so today, as we dive into the message, I want to ask you a question. 
essential. What is essential? You know, we've heard that word so many times over these past two months, haven't we? Uh, Talking about essential workers, essential jobs. Maybe the only word we have heard more than that might be unprecedented. It is unprecedented how many times we have heard the word essential in the last eight weeks. Am I right? (laughs) I think so. (laughs) But what does the word essential actually mean? By one definition, essential means that which is absolutely essential necessary. So in the case of a society or an economy like ours, we know it is essential for healthcare workers, for truck drivers, for uh, grocery store employees and first responders, and, and those are just to name a few, to be able to do their jobs in a certain way no matter what. And why is that the case? Well, because what they do is essential, is absolutely necessary to keeping our way of life going. To say something is essential is to say it forms the very essence of of something greater, something larger than itself. So water, for instance, is essential to life on this planet. The family unit is essential. It is the building block of every society we've seen throughout civilization. And the shipping industry is essential to a consumer-driven, consumer-based economy like our own. And if you go and remove these essential elements, what happens? Well, at best, that system is going to shift. It is going to adapt, maybe tremendously. At worst, that system might fall apart completely. So with that in mind, let me ask you another question. What should we understand as essential when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus Christ? What is absolutely necessary in order to be his follower as he defines and he describes what that means and what that looks like? In other words, I'm asking, what are the essentials of discipleship? Well, I believe Luke begins to to give us an answer to that in these first 11 verses of Acts chapter 1 as we, we just read them moments ago. And I believe it's an answer actually in three parts, which we are going to explore in these next three weeks leading us to Pentecost. So if you're already at chapter one of of Luke's account, the Acts of the Apostles, then great. If you're not, please turn there with me as we begin to unpack this. You know, as you're turning there, let me remind you, today is the sixth Sunday of Easter. It feels like Easter was a year ago to me. I don't know about you, but six weeks ago, uh, this begins the sixth week. And so that means that this Thursday, the 40th day after Easter, is what we know as Ascension Day in the history of the church. Some go and call it the Feast of the Ascension. But if you're like me, you've spent most of your life not paying much attention to the difference between the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. And some might say, well, what's the big deal, Ben? Why do we need to be so particular about the resurrection and the ascension? Well, let me ask you, how different do you understand the cross when you also begin to understand the resurrection? You see, the cross is incomplete without what God reveals through the resurrection of Christ. In the same way, the resurrection of Christ is incomplete without what God reveals through the ascension of Christ. It is in his ascension that the resurrected Christ is restored, as we proclaim, to his rightful position of exaltation as the king of all creation. We already have shared that in many ways this morning, but including as Pastor Greg led us in Psalm 47, which we now attribute not to an Israelite king of old, as it may have been when the psalmist originally composed it, but now we attribute that to the risen king that is Jesus Christ. As we declared in Psalm 47, sing praises to God, sing praises to our king. For God is the king of all the earth. God is king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. He is highly exalted. As the writer to the Hebrews describes it in chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for the time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So the scriptures, if we're paying attention, 
reveal how Christ has ascended, has moved from this earthly realm and dimension back into the heavenly realm and dimension and is victoriously seated at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand, that place of honor, that place of of glory, that place of favor. And as we confess in the Apostles' Creed, from that place, he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. And in the meantime, it is also from that position of highly exalted honor and favor and power that Jesus Christ, the the exalted son of God and also the exalted son of man is in communion with the Father. And from that place, they have sent the Holy Spirit to empower his church here upon the earth. That's a lot of theology. That's a lot of abstract ideas that we sometimes struggle with. What does that really mean in my life today, Ben? I know the Apostles' Creed. I've memorized this part of a certain catechism or that part of a certain statement of faith. But but what does that really mean right here, right now? Well, remember what Jesus told his disciples before he actually was crucified. In those precious days leading up to what we call the week of his passion. Beginning with verses 5 and going through 11 of John chapter 16. Remember what Jesus said. But now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, the comforter, the helper, the encourager won't come. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So what we need to understand is that because of his crucifixion and resurrection, Christ's work of making atonement, of reconciling us to God, that has been complete. Today, if you are wondering, can I be made right with God? Yes, yes, you have been in and through what Christ has already done. And by the same token, because of his ascension, the the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit who is sent in the name of Christ, that, my friends, is ongoing. That is available and right now to us, in us, and through us in this life, in this world, even in such a time as this. We'll say much more about that in the weeks as we go ahead toward Pentecost. But for now, I want us to see how essential certain elements are to the very nature of our Christian faith and to the life of discipleship following in the way of Jesus Christ as he himself defines it. So as we go forward over these next three weeks, I want you to understand we we're journeying towards Pentecost, exploring three essentials of discipleship as Luke introduces them to us here in Acts chapter one. The first that we will unpack more in the time we have left today is this, disciples stake their lives upon the reality of the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. The second essential we'll dive into next week is that disciples learn what it means to live in the kingdom of God. And lastly, as we get to Pentecost itself, two Sundays from now, disciples are dependent upon the Holy Spirit for all of this. (laughs) Disciples are dependent upon the Holy Spirit for not only... Essentials one and two, but for the mission that God has given us with him in the world today. So are you ready? Number one, the first essential of discipleship. Disciples stake their lives upon the reality of the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Well, how is this, you may be asking, essential to discipleship? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. But... Before we can ask that one and answer that one, let's ask and answer one more question, shall we? How vital is the resurrection itself as a literal historical fact in the life of the church? Whenever possible, I like to let scripture answer questions like that. And so according to the apostle Paul, as we shall see here in a moment, it is absolutely vital 
The resurrection is the bedrock upon which all of Christianity rises or falls. It is everything upon which our faith stands. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 12, says it this way. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection from the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty in your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. How serious is the reality of the resurrection for the church? Very. <laughs> And why is that the case? Well, as Paul explains, if, if Christ is not raised, how could we say and how could we live as if God truly is victorious over death? How could we sing, you make graves into gardens? If Christ is not raised, how could we know that Christ is victorious over the power of sin and I do not have to be enslaved to the bondage of sin and to death and the evil one, but instead I can be a servant, no, even more, a child of God. If Christ is not raised, how and why would we ever possibly believe that living the way Jesus lived and loving the way Jesus loves is indeed the only right way when all things shall be said and done? The resurrection is the demonstration in power of the validity and the truth of everything we just asked. But you know, it's one thing to believe that. It's one thing to know that intellectually. It's one thing to be able to spout off the Apostles' Creed as I was able to do by the time I was eight years old as our congregation recited it every week. But it's another thing to be a human being who knows the truth of what it means to say Christ is alive. Not just know it here, but to know it in the depth of who you are. And if you're going to build your life on that truth, stake your life upon it, even if it could one day cost you your life, as it has for Christians for 2,000 years at some way, somehow, some point around the earth, well, you better have much more than just good doctrine. And thankfully, for our sake, God has given us more than just good teaching. He has given us more than just the scriptures and not, not to demean the scriptures by any means. But what I'm trying to say is the Lord is always so gracious to provide over and abundantly what we need. And so remember what Jesus did. Back to Acts chapter one, verse three. What did he do? He presented himself alive to his disciples after his suffering by many proofs. How many of us know it is one thing to hear about Jesus from somebody else. It's one thing to consider Jesus and, and, and think about Jesus, to study about Jesus. It's one thing to know about who he is and who he claims to be. But it is so much more to know him, to know who he is to experience, as we say as, as Christ's church, your soul opened to the very presence of God, to the very presence of the risen Lord himself. And while such an encounter certainly does involve our feelings, and, and, and I'm not, uh, again, demeaning that in any way, we, we know what it is to feel the presence of God, Oftentimes we speak in that kind of language, but it goes much deeper than our feelings. It must, it has to. Our feelings can shift. Our feelings might be fickle. But there's something that happens when faith is born deep within us. Something that is so undeniable. You know, there's an old song that many of us are familiar with. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. That old Gaither song is born 
born out of this thing we can't quite put our finger on. We can't quite describe it. We can't quite explain it. We try to sing about it. We try to write about it. We try to preach about it. But there's something that happens when we encounter the risen Lord that we just know. And it is essential, truly essential, for a disciple of Christ to know that he is alive in our hearts, in our spirit, in our, in our lives, because you have somehow encountered him, his living presence in a way that you cannot deny, in a way that will come to define everything about your life, who you are, why you are here, and how you shall live. The first disciples needed that kind of encounter with the risen Lord, as, as Luke tells us here in, in Acts. And they received it multiple times in those 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. But even after that, Saul of Tarsus, who we usually call Paul instead, he needed that kind of encounter with Christ, and, and he received it on the road to Damascus. And You can turn to Acts chapter 9 and read about that later today. And even though Paul didn't see the ascended Christ, according to that account, physically, uh, Paul still heard his voice, had an encounter with Christ spiritually that affected him deeply and, and changed him in some way in that moment. But even more, that spiritual encounter with Christ set Paul on a course of lifelong transformation, of sanctification, as he would call it, and as we should call it today. As he followed Christ, the Holy Spirit was working in his life, working on him and in him and through him for the rest of his days. That is essential to what it means to walk in the way of discipleship. So if the first disciples needed the Lord to present himself alive to them, if the apostle Paul needed the Lord to present himself alive to him, why would we not need the same thing? So thank God that in his abundant and lavish love and grace that Jesus Christ still calls his would-be disciples and reveals himself to us even today. Now how does that happen, you may be asking. Well, it happens to some like it happened to Paul. There are some of us that, that can say, hey, there was a time in my life when God really showed up and knocked me on my backside the way he did Paul. Maybe I was walking the wrong way. Maybe there was something in my life that God had finally said enough. And in his grace, in his mercy, he reached down and he picked us up, as the psalmist says, out of the miry bog, out of the, the, the clay, the mud, and he set our feet on solid rock. And although we couldn't understand much of what was happening at the time, we knew that some way, somehow, God had gotten a hold of us. For some of us, we've encountered the risen Christ in that way. For others among us, Christ reveals himself maybe in a more subtle way. And that's because someone has asked. As we did earlier today, someone has interceded. Maybe it was your grandmother praying for you. Maybe it was uh, your spouse praying for you. Maybe it was uh, you praying for your children. Or maybe it was your children praying for you. Or maybe it was you crying out, saying, Lord, Show me. Make yourself known to me in a way I can't deny. Reveal yourself to me. Because there's power in those kinds of prayers. The Lord responds to those kinds of prayers. Paul himself offered one on behalf of the early church at Ephesus. And we read this in Ephesus chapter 1. He says, for that, on behalf of that church in that day, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people... I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, 
not only in the present age, but also in the one that is to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We can encounter the risen Lord when his spirit makes our hearts and minds open and receptive to his word. And as the life and teaching of Christ, as as the scriptures and the spirit reveal them, as they are made known to us, he is made known to us. So Christ is revealed to us through the scripture. He's revealed to us in and through the spirit at work among us and within us. And for those whom God has called, suddenly his, his crucifixion, his, his suffering is no longer foolishness to us. It's no longer a stumbling block that makes no sense. Instead, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, they, they mean everything to you. Suddenly they become the reality, the lens through which you see everything and everyone, including yourself, in this life. And once the scales have fallen off, once the chains have fallen off from your heart in that way, you cannot unsee what God has shown you. You cannot go back. That's what faith really is. And this is something that that, that we need to recapture in our culture, and not just our our American culture, but in the church culture that we, we live and we move in, my friends. I can't make you believe. And I can sit down with you and we can walk through every single line of scripture and we can go through church history and we can study ancient Hebrew and study ancient Greek and we can do all of these things. But at the end of the day, none of that matters if it all stays here. We are utterly dependent upon God to reveal himself to us in such a way that all of our knowledge becomes knowledge in the most intimate of ways, truly knowing him. That's what this is all about. Something happens when we know we are forgiven. Something happens when we know we are chosen, we are accepted, we are loved, we are reconciled. Something happens when we know we are his, and no matter what comes, we belong to him. As the old timers used to say, there's something that happens when you know that you know that you know. And you hear in your heart that invitation that Christ gives to those who would become his disciples. And you hear somewhere within you, you hear him say, come, follow me. And no matter where answering that call may lead, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. When fear drives others to panic, or to maliciousness, or to violence, when fear of suffering and death in some causes them to inflict those very things upon others, disciples of Christ, my friends, will live by a very different way, his way. Knowing that if we are following him, our lives, our deaths, and our being raised as he was raised are all in his hands. That's what it means to be a disciple. Disciples stake their lives upon the reality of the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. If we are to be his disciples, therefore, it is essential. It is absolutely necessary that we surrender our lives completely to the one who gave his life completely for you, for me, for the entire world. I can't make that clear enough. And as a preacher, I am always aware of how words fall short. There's so much more than just words when it comes to what it means to experience the presence of the risen Lord, what it means to know him, what it means to be loved by him and to love him as he enables us to in return, what it means to walk in the way of the kingdom of God. Well, my friends, there's more about that next week as we'll talk more about learning the ways of the kingdom, the second essential of discipleship that Luke introduces us here in Acts chapter one. But 
as we begin to draw things to a close here for this morning. Let me ask you, what is your life staked upon? In this time of pandemic, many people have had to answer that question as they've watched their, their retirement disappear, if they've watched their employment disappear, if they've watched so many things that they have depended upon be revealed as far, far less than absolutely trustworthy. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Now, I'm not making light of, of anybody who's found themselves in financial hardship. I'm not at all. That's a very real, very practical, very legitimate concern. And I'm so thankful that, that Christ Church, your generosity in this time has been exemplary. And the number of people we have been allowed to, to, to walk alongside, whether it's been with the food pantry, whether it's been with benevolence and financial assistance, it has been tremendous. And so thank you, thank you for that. And for those of you who may be in need of those things, know that, that, that your church family is here and we are available and God is ready to meet your needs in and through God's people in powerful ways. That is a blessing that we are meant to share one with another. That no one should be in lack among the family of God. And so we give God thanks for that. But what has God been doing in this time to, to allow us to reevaluate our sense of priorities, what we have thought is absolutely necessary in our lives? Is church essential? You better believe it is church as who we are. And so in a time like this where we have been working toward what does it mean to start gathering back together, you, you've maybe seen how we have started to share our, our plan to move into smaller groups first. Groups that are already meeting online, which is a great, great resource that we thank God for in such a time as this. So if you, my friends, have not gathered in some way, shape, or form with one of our, our groups that's meeting online, I want you to, to reach out to Pastor Greg our group's pastor who led us in that opening psalm today, greg at ccnash.org, and he will get you connected immediately with a group that's already meeting online with plans very soon to begin meeting in smaller groups in person. This is essential to discipleship, my friends. Yes, we are looking forward to when that time will be when we can gather some way, somehow in the sanctuary again. But that is not the essence of the church. It's a beautiful way we worship. It's a beautiful way we are allowed to gather and come together. But it is not the essence. The essence is, first of all, who is God in your life? How are you encountering the risen Lord in your walk. We need to be able to experience that personally. And then as God brings us to experience that corporately, how did the early church do it? By meeting in one another's homes. As they went and studied the, the teaching of the apostles, as they broke bread, as they gathered for fellowship, and as they prayed for and with one another. That's the essence of how the church was born, my friends. And so what is essential to the church is discipleship. And so you need to hear me say this. When we are finally back together, all together in one place, I still want us all gathering in smaller groups throughout the week in our homes where life is being lived in the ups and downs with all of our needs, with all of our fears and failures and, and, and the sins that need to be forgiven and, and people need to walk through with us with all of our joys and celebrations. That's where our life is lived and it is way beyond what happens in any building on Sunday morning. Hear me, church. And so right now, Seize this opportunity for what it is to answer the call to discipleship that Jesus is still offering to those who will hear in your heart, come, follow me. And let's do that. Connecting with other believers in ways where we can know who they are. They can know who we are. Because that's how discipleship happens. How the Lord knows us and how we are made known one to another as the people of God in those groups, those small groups, those discipleship elements. So as we wrap up our time together this morning, 
I just want to encourage you with a word of thanks. We're going to pray here in a moment as we close. And as we do, I want to thank you, Christ Church, and many of you who are joining us outside of our local congregation. I want to thank you when you have walked in the way of Christ in this time. Right now there are so many voices saying so many things about the situation we are all in. Some of those voices are angry. Some of those voices are malicious. Some of those voices are seeking to tear others down rather than build others up. Church, this is a time for us to walk in the way of Jesus Christ, to love one another well. We are called to speak truth. We are called to be responsible in what we are learning and how we are sharing that. We are called to walk in a way that shows Christ is alive, not just to us, but Christ is alive in us. So this week, let's be mindful as we share and talk and as we begin moving forward more and more back out into society. Is Christ alive, not just to us, but in us? Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful. We are thankful for your faithfulness, thankful for who you have revealed yourself to be to so many of us, proven in ways that our hearts resonate with in ways we may not fully be able to explain or articulate but Lord you are faithful to do this for everyone who comes to faith who receives the gift of faith that you so freely give so Lord right now I lift up those who may be hearing my voice who who are yearning for that kind of faith. As we, we shared already before, Lord, there are times we feel like our faith is intellectual and yet what does it mean to make it visceral? Lord, we believe but help our unbelief. For those who are struggling, for those of us who may be questioning, for those of us who know that unless you reveal yourself in some powerful way, we are struggling, Lord. We are flailing. We may even be sinking in a sea of doubt or confusion or anger or sin. So Lord, right now, right now, as we are gathered, would you reach out? Would you reveal yourself as only you can? Speak to hearts, Lord, right now. I need to hear a word from you specifically for that one for that person Lord you, you can do this you love us so much that you reveal yourself in this way to those who seek your face to those who seek you with all their heart you shall be found so for those right now who are seeking you Lord reveal yourself Lord in your mercy Thank you, Lord. Church family, right where you are, I encourage you to listen, not just with your ears, listen with your heart. Shut out the noise that can drown us every day simply be in his presence right now. If your child is in your arms, hold her, hold him closely and know that the Lord could speak to that gentle and that tender heart as well as the Lord can speak to your own. 
If you are separated from someone right now, if you're missing someone who you can't be with right now, know that the Lord is capable of ministering to that one in this time as well. I think of our beloved elders who have so often struggled with isolation and loneliness before and to experience that even more so now. Lord, in your mercy, touch those who have lived and have so much to share. Who right now, there are voices in our culture that would seemingly forget them. Lord, may it not be so. And may your church be the ones who rise up and say, no, no. This shall not be the way of it. For all of God's children, from the oldest to the youngest, our beloved, and you have made it so that we may hear your voice, Lord, speaking within our hearts. And so do that now, we pray, Lord. Would you do that now? Lord, make us your disciples. Knit our hearts together with yours and with one another. Unite your church. Bring your people together for such a time as this. Do not let us fall prey to the wiles of the enemy who has been defeated. Do let us not let us fall victim to slavery and sin, which you have shown yourself victorious over, when we would seek to be divided and to tear one another down. Unite us, Lord, in you. in the life that you offer. In your presence. Do what only you can do, Lord. You are the only one who can. We stake our lives on this claim. We stake our lives on who you are. The one who lived for us, the one who died for us, the one who was raised to life again for us, the one who now is ascended and is seated on high, exalted at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, for us and for all of creation. That is worth living for. That is worth giving our lives to. So Lord, right now, may we offer our lives anew to you. You are the potter, we are the clay, we are your disciples. We are your children. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. And in his name, the one through whom you've made this all possible, The one who still says, come, follow me. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Receive this blessing spoken over the people of God for generation upon generation. And may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen and amen. We love you, church family. Go in the peace of God now, this day and this week to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.